This week we are continuing on our series on the Big Story soundtrack. And we're going back into the Psalms again. And we've actually been in the Psalms for most of the series. And we're in the Psalms for so, uh, so often in the series because really the Psalms are the worship book of the Bible. They were the worship book of Jesus. They were, they were Jesus' hymn book, the hymn book of the Hebrews, and really our hymn book as well. I mean, we look at contemporary songs and hymns. The themes of those hymns come from the Psalms. And the Psalms have this way of inviting our whole lives into worship. Walter Brueggemann, the famous Old Testament scholar, puts it this way. He says, The Psalms draw our whole lives under the rule of God where everything may be submitted to Yahweh. And so the Psalms give us this really tremendous gift. This gift of being able to give every aspect of our lives to God. And we see in the Psalms this kind of... uh, this movement, this journey, really, that kind of models our lives as well. We see the different themes in the Psalms that they also echo the themes in our lives. In the Psalms, we see Psalms of orientation. Psalms that show the goodness of God and the rightness of the world. We see these Psalms sometimes extolling a king or extolling God's goodness, um, extolling his creation. And we also read of psalms of reorientation, of new insight, of new help, of of, uh, new focus and peace and resilience in the midst of struggle. That out of struggle, new uh, insight was given and new wisdom was found. And in between those psalms of orientation and the psalms of disorientation are psalms of, I mean, psalms of orientation and reorientation are psalms of disorientation. And that's where we're going to focus this week, on psalms of disorientation, especially how do we worship in the midst of disorientating times in our life, when the world just does not seem to work, where life is not the way it should be, where we don't experience God's goodness or wonder if God even exists. All of us experience orientation. You know, I remember, I mean, major times of orientation in my life were, you know, getting married to Catherine. On that day, everything was right. The, you know, it seemed like God God was good, the world was good, everything was good. When Eben was born, a time of orientation, even though we had a tough birth, holding him in my arms, everything was good, life was good. This is the way things were meant to be. And I'm sure you can all think of those times of orientation in your life. We have them in big ways, like those big events in my life, but also in small ways. Every day, there's just these moments of orientation. I often do a spiritual discipline at the end of my day called uh, the examine, that I know many of you practice as well. And that's this very simple prayer exercise where you think about where was desolation in your life? Where on that day, at the end of the day, where did you just experience desolation, a lack of grace? But also, where did you experience consolation? The, the presence of grace. And those moments often remind me of orientation, of God's, God's here, God's good, things are all right. And then there's those moments of reorientation where out of struggle you get this insight or wisdom. You get new kind of understanding. I know just the other day I was uh, kind of around Elkai area and I was just sitting there struggling with something. I was reading the scripture, just praying, and insight came. Just it was wisdom, kind of a calm, uh, resilience, just a moment of clarity. And all of us get those at times when we're praying, when we're um, taking our quiet times, studying scripture, when we're taking walks, talking with our friends and family, just, you know, random times of the day. We receive those moments of reorientation. And so when we come to worship, we also have those. In the very beginning of our service often, call to worship is a moment of orientation. This is who God is. And then we often sing hymns and songs of orientation as well. And then reorientation times often are during the sermon and and during times of prayer and also during musical interludes and, and hymns and songs as well. And those are times that I think for us are fairly easy to worship. It's easy to worship when life is good. I mean, sometimes we forget to praise God in those times, but there's a lot to praise God about in those times. 
of orientation and reorientation. It's the times of disorientation that are often the hardest. The challenging, uh, those are the moments of challenge for us in our worship of how do I worship when, when things are not good, when things are not worshiping, I mean working as they should, when, where life is not the way it should be, when God seems absent or not present and I am not worshiping God, I am wandering far away. One of the ways that we uh, have in worship to express disorientation is confession. So like today, Gretchen so beautifully encapsulated our kind of response to our own personal disorientation when we know we are not following God the way we should. And so that's a way we express disorientation, but there are times when confession and repentance cannot cover the kind of disorientation we feel. For example, uh, a while back, I had uh, someone at my previous church uh, come to my office who was close to suicidal. He was really struggling. And as we talked through his struggles, he realized that one of his problems was that he felt like his dark time that he was going through was, was sin. He kept going, well, God must be angry at me because I'm depressed. God must be angry at me because I don't see any hope in my life. And that was something that he didn't need to repent of. It's something that he was experiencing, part of the brokenness of the world around him. Disorientation is this experience with the brokenness of the world around us. It's our experience with suffering and pain. Our experience when life does not go the way it should. Our experiences with massive struggle and overwhelming needs around the world. And in those times... We don't often go, I praise you, God. We're so thankful for you. Oh, amen. We go, how long? How long will you turn your face away? God, where are you in the midst of my suffering? Where are you in the midst of my pain? Those are those moments of disorientation that we see most encapsulated in the Psalms through lament. Lament is this language of expressing grief sorrow, complaint, and anger. And it's really a way that we worship God. How many of you lament regularly in your daily or weekly worship? Okay, got one? Got one or two hands? Okay. It is hard, I think, for us to lament. Because firstly, we're not taught lament. I don't think most of us growing up, if you grew up in a Christian home, were taught accuse God when you're angry. <laughs> no. You know, we're taught, don't accuse God. God's good all the time. You know, we shouldn't accuse God. You know, be, express your anger to God when things aren't going well. No, we, we, we have this kind of picture of, well, God is good, so we got to praise him all the time. I know when I was a Christian, when I first became a Christian, I had this wrong idea. I don't think anyone gave it to me. It's just, well, maybe everyone was practicing it around me, so I saw it modeled. That just, yeah, when you were a Christian, you had to be joyful all the time. You had to be happy. You had to, you know, your troubles have gone away. You're redeemed. So when my first uh, years of being a Christian were just spent in such struggle, because I was struggling. I was struggling with, you know, the loss of my dad a few years earlier. I was struggling with disorientation in the move that we moved across the country. I was struggling with not finding friends and feeling awkward and alone and isolated, all these things. And when I became a Christian, I didn't know how to express those things to God. Like, how do I express these things? And I would see the world around me. I mean, homelessness and struggles and abuse and war and just major issues around us going, how do I express this to God? And lament really gives us that language. It gives us a language to express the struggles that don't have easy answers to God, and even to express our angers and struggle to God when God doesn't seem present and acting in the ways that we think he should, or the ways of his character that are dictated in the scriptures. Lament gives us this language, and it is a foreign language. It is not something that the church often has practiced throughout the years. But we see that clearly the people of God throughout 
um, the history of God's work in Israel, they practiced lament and it gave them a way to express the hardest moments of their life and the world around them and their experience where they just didn't understand what was going on to God. They could, they could worship God in the midst of those hard things. So often we think that disorientation or like that kind of accusation is doubt. It is a lack of faith. But actually we see throughout the Psalms that lament is, is, is a, the, kind of one of the most purest expressions of faith. Being able to lament to God is an act of faithfulness. Because even giving those doubts and struggles to God, you're giving them to God. And that is part of the faithful journey. So often when we hit those times of disorientation, we either want to run to orientation, we want to like just get back to the way things, why can't I get back to the way things were? Things were so good back then. Oh man, we, we focus on the past or some alternate ending we would like to have. Or we try to run to reorientation right away. Try to go, okay, I got to get positive. I got to get my mindset right. I can't focus on these things. You can either put those hard things away, try to lock them in some closet, or just try to kind of visualize them away. Try to, you know, say the right mantra, do enough yoga, (laughs) read the right books, and then suddenly they'll be gone. But we know that doesn't work that way. No matter how much we try, we can't run to orientation when we're in the midst of disorientation, and we can't run to reorientation until it's time. Disorientation is, is a journey. My friend uh, uh, and mentor, Jerry Sitzer, he's a, a former professor at Whitworth College, uh, my alma mater at Whitworth University now. Um, he uh, lost his, uh, much of his family to a car accident when I was in college. Lost his mother, his wife, his daughter, and his other children were severely um, injured. And in his book, A Grace Disguised, he talks about how he's having these nightmares. About uh, he was in this dark place, and he could see this kind of dark pit. And he was running, he was trying to run away from the darkness. And he could see the light in the distance, but the, the sun was always kind of receding from him. And so he's kept running to the sun, but the sun kept running away from him. And he'd always wake up just kind of in this cold sweat. And his uh, sister told him, uh, as he kind of explained that, that, you know, the way that you get to the sun is not chasing after the sun. The way you get to the sun is actually going through the darkness, and you meet the sun on its course. And so for him, that was this analogy that he has to take that dark journey of disorientation. He can't just run to orientation again, because life is not the same. There's a new normal. There's a new reality. And he can't just run to reorientation. Things are not better. And he can't lie to himself and say that they are. And that's the journey of the Psalms for us as well, this journey of lament. That when we are feeling disorientation, whether it's about our own disorientation, whether it's about uh, the disorientation in the world around us, the, the massive struggles we see in the world, The Psalms give us a way to respond to God. So today we are going to study the movement of lament. And there are basically four movements. The first movement is crying out or complaining. The second movement is petition. uh, Asking of God honestly what you need or what you think you want. The third movement is trust or remembrance. And the fourth movement is trust. So we're going to look at these movements of lament as we see them in the psalm, in Psalm 13 today, so that we can also be drawn to this deeper journey in the midst of the struggles in our life and assured that God is in the midst of that journey. It is not a journey of faithfulness, but a journey of faithlessness. It is a journey of faithfulness. So I encourage you to see those four movements in Psalm 13 Uh, right now. You can turn to that. I'm going to read it. in a second, I encourage you to see where is the complaint, where is the petition, where is the remembrance, and where is the trust. The psalmist writes in Psalm 13, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts 
and every day have sorrow in my heart. How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, O Lord my God. Give lights to my eyes, or I will sleep in death. My enemy will say, I have overcome him, and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord, for he has been good to me. So the first movement that we see in this psalm is the movement of complaint. And the psalmist is um, bold in his complaint. He writes, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? That is a bold thing to say to God. I don't know if any of us in the last week have said that to God. How long? Why are you hiding your face from me? Usually we'll qualify that really quickly with, but God, you're good. No, God, you're great. You're here. You're, you're telling me stuff. I'm just not seeing it. You know, it's, it's not you. It's me. You know, often that's our response. But you see, the psalmist does not do that. He is bold in his complaint. Walter Brueggemann, uh, who I quoted before, Old Testament scholar, he wrote this. The surprise of Israel's worship and prayer is that the extravagance of praise does not silence or censor Israel's need, but seems to legitimate and authorize a second extravagance, the extravagance of complaint and lament, accusation, petition, indignation, assault, and insistence. I love the way Brigham says that. I mean, when we look at the uh, scriptures about Israel's worship, we see that it was extravagant. I mean, they pulled out all the stops. They had everything in their worship. They, they had thousands of, of musicians and singers all praising God. The temple was just, uh, you know, over, always filled with just extravagant worship. But Brigham says that there's that other extravagance that God allows in the worship of Israel, which is that extravagance of complaints and indignation. And, and we see that boldness in this psalm. There is only accusation in this first part of the psalm. There's no, you know, trying to somehow work it out and say, oh God, you're good. I, I, I can't really complain about anything. Everything's actually quite good in my life. You know, there's just accusation. A couple years ago, I went on a retreat. I usually go on a yearly retreat to a monastery and spend three or four days in prayer. And I usually take one or two psalms and I memorize them. And I remember when I went on a retreat a couple of years ago, I, had, I came up to Psalm 13 and I was like, uh, I don't know if I want to memorize this one. It just seemed a little too harsh. It was hard to enter into that language of lament. And it is hard for us to do that as well. But it's amazing to see that God gives us that permission to lament, to experience God's absence, even though God is present. That's really what we do when we complain, is we are experiencing God's absence, even though God is present. We see in Psalm 13 that the psalmist is faithful to God. Faithfulness is not his problem. He is a faithful person. So when God's character does not seem to match up with God's actions, the psalmist has permission to accuse him, to go, why aren't you doing these things you should be doing? For him, that's a part of faithfulness. It's a part of living in faithfulness. And that's also a permission that we have to be faithful as well. Another professor of mine um, at Whitworth College University, sorry, it was Whitworth College when I went there, um, Jim Hunt, he was a a professor that actually took me to Central America when I was a senior in college. And a friend that I met in our Central America trip, his daughter, a couple years after we graduated from college, she actually died in a horrific bus accident. She was a missionary in Bolivia. Uh, Right after college, she went to Bolivia to to be a missionary, and she's given her life to God. And then, yeah, she was going back to her village over these mountains. The bus she was in just careened over a cliff. And 
a few years later, I was able to hear from Professor Hunt about how he responded to that. You know, his, his daughter was taken from him. And he said that the way he responded is that every day for two years straight, he just screamed at God. He screamed. Every day he'd go to this little house they had um, where he often went to pray, and he'd just scream at God. You know, for five minutes, ten minutes, a half an hour, an hour, he'd scream and yell and cry out and, and sob, and he would just do that over and over again for two years until he said it just stopped. I just stopped needing to do that. But the one thing he said was important about that screaming and yelling and accusing God and his anger at God is that he did that in prayer. He did that every day during his quiet time. That was his quiet time. And I think he understood what the psalmist is saying here, that this is something we do with God, not outside of God. So often when we, when we ask those questions, God, where are you? God, why aren't you working? God, why aren't you, why aren't you fixing things? We kind of feel like we have to do that outside of faith. You know, if we did that in the church, we would think that maybe people would start looking at us funny. Like, whoa, they need some help, obviously, you know. Um, but really, we see that the psalmist is bringing this, this right into church. This is something that happens in church, not outside of church. It happens in our faith, not outside our faith. And that's something that maybe we've just not, not experienced, something that God has for us. Just because we've not practiced it as a church as much or not seen it practiced in especially the American church doesn't mean that God doesn't have this blessing for us. And so it's something that maybe we uh, have just not experienced from God's goodness and we kind of need to experience. And out of this complaint we see comes petition. The psalmist wrote, Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give lights to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall. And again, we see the boldness of his petition here. He's basically saying to God that, God, if you don't help me here, I'm going to die. Do you really want me to die and my enemies to say that they've defeated me and they really defeated you? Do you really want that to happen? So he's bringing this bold complaint, but also a bold petition. God, help me. God, be with me. God, please do what you say you will do. Brueggemann again wrote, that the, song, the laments pray God's character back to God and insist that Yahweh be who Yahweh asserts God's own self to be. And isn't that an interesting way to approach prayer? That the laments pray God's character back to God. We see throughout the scriptures what God's character is. God's character is justice. God's character is mercy. God's character is love. God's character is grace. God is powerful, and God shows his power through sacrifice and love. We see that throughout the scriptures. We see that, that God is mighty, that he is the victor, like we talked about last week, about Jesus, that he is Lord of all. We th see these things about the character and person of God in Jesus Christ. And when we don't see them working out in the world... We're called to bring God's character back to him. To say, God, you are merciful. Act in mercy. You are loving. Act in love. I can't see that, you're, that where the love is. Please bring your love. Show your mercy. Show your kindness. And obviously, our petitions are frail and they're incomplete. Whenever we call out to God and ask God for something, we know that most likely we're not asking the right thing or we're not asking in the right way, or we don't even know what we're supposed to really ask for. But the blessing in here is that we're still called to ask. Even though our petitions are incomplete, even though we, God is doing his will, and he's working his will, and so our prayers, you know, are, we may not get what we ask for, God may have another way of, of answering that prayer. Still, we are called to ask and ask boldly. Ask boldly in prayer. And if you have a hard time asking that, what are, what are your petitions? What are, what are your complaints? 
These are a few questions to consider if you have a hard time understanding what your laments are. You can ask yourself, what are you longing for that has not been fulfilled? What have you cried out to God about that has not been answered? Where in your, your life does it feel that God has hidden himself from you? Where is the sorrow in your heart? What enemies are triumphing over you? And as we ask those questions of ourselves, laments come. And often those laments can be scary because we don't want to lament. We don't think we should lament. Like I said, it's like a foreign language to us. But it is really the way that we deeply interact and relate with God. But sometimes we may go, well, I just don't have answers to those questions. I don't have any of those deep sorrows in my heart right now. I don't have any things I'm crying out for that have not been answered. And that's okay because we know that with lament, even though we don't have laments for ourselves, we can lament for others as well. Though you may not have any laments, many, many others do. There is a chorus of laments coming out of Afghanistan right now. Just a vast chorus of lament. And we can raise our voice in lament to that chorus. There's a chorus of lament coming out of Haiti, coming out of Africa, coming out from around the world, coming out from our neighborhood in our city. People crying out those things. Why aren't you here? Where are you, God? Please work according to your character. And we can add to that chorus our prayers as well. And we add to that chorus, not in faithlessness, going, oh, God, I don't even know if I believe in you anymore, but in faithfulness, going, I know your character, God. I know who you are, and I believe in you. And so I call out for you to act according to your character for my friend who is suffering. I ask you to act according to your character for someone who's been racially segregated against. I ask for you to act according to your character for someone who's been abused for someone who is starving, for someone who is uh, struggling just to live another day. I ask for you to uh, act according to your character. And we trust that God is somehow. But we still can cry out. And we see that at the psalmist does this, exactly what we've talked about. He complains boldly. He petitions boldly. But all the psalms don't end there. They, they never end there. You can see in every lament in the psalms, they always have that circular kind of progression. Start with complaint, go to petition, and then go to remembrance and trust. And that's the cycle of the psalms. It goes over and over again. We see the psalmist sometimes go that whole way and then start over again in the same psalm. And that's our progression of our life as well and our faith. We come with our complaints, we come with our petition, but then we, we progress to this trust. This trust that comes out sometimes of unanswered prayers. It comes in the midst of complaints and petitions. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 13, but, but I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation i will sing the lord's praise for he has been good to me and notice that that's not at the beginning so often we want to rush to that last part you know if you're quoting scripture to somebody somebody who's having a hard time you probably wouldn't quote the first part of psalm 13 <laughs> you'd probably just quote this last verse because that's the encouraging verse right we, that's what one we want to give to others but we can't just run there. We have to stop at the first parts first. And then it makes this last part that much more meaningful. Without going through the struggle and going through the complaint and going through the petition, this last part is not meaningful to us. It doesn't have any meats to it. It doesn't have any depth to it. Because this is an act of faith for the psalmist. He is choosing to trust in the goodness and unfailing love of God, even in the midst of the complaint and the petition. He is saying, my petition is a faithful one. My complaint is a faithful one. I will trust even though. Uh, Karl Barth calls this a defiant nevertheless. 
We will trust God nevertheless. It's going to be a defiant nevertheless. That in the midst of all that's going on, we will say defiantly, I still trust this God. Even though I may not see any evidence to God's work with my own frail, you know, limited two eyes, I'm still going to trust that God is working. Michael Card, a famous contemporary Christian artist and writer, he wrote, Though through Psalms of Lament, as perhaps nowhere else in Scripture, a God is revealed who uses and utilizes everything, especially pain. All true songs of worship are born in the wilderness of suffering. And that's what we see this progression of the psalmist here. His song of praise was born in the wilderness of suffering. And that's where our song of praise is founded as well and so we're challenged to have this language of lament because that's where the journey of our faith actually deepens that our our song of worship is born in the wilderness of lament i was reading the other day about an example of this by uh, a contemporary music artist not not all of you may know who he is his name is john mark mcmillan He wrote a very famous contemporary song that some people love and some people don't love as much called uh, How He Loves. How He Loves Us. He is jealous for me. Uh, There's one part in there that kind of causes a little controversy where he says, uh, like, God kisses us with a sloppy wet kiss. And some people change that. (laughs) They're like, does God have a sloppy wet kiss? I don't know. That's for you to judge if you sing the song. But this song is such a powerful song about God's love. The chorus is, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves. The verse first goes, he is jealous for me. Loves like a hurricane. I am a tree, bending beneath the waves of his grace and mercy. Such beautiful poetry. But I was reading the other day that he actually wrote this after one of his friends died in a car accident. He was uh, so angry and frustrated with God, he wrote, that Uh, This is one of the ways that he processes his life through song. So as he was processing, he went through that language of complaint and, and petition, and then out of it came this song. He is jealous for me. Love's like a hurricane. I am a tree. Bending beneath the waves of his grace and mercy. How he loves us. That was the, the song that came out of his suffering. That God somehow is so loving and so good and so amazing, even in the midst of suffering. And we see this through our Lord Jesus Christ. Because our Lord Jesus Christ is not, was not a foreigner to the language of lament. It is such a blessing to, to know that our Lord lamented as well. He cried out to God with complaints on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In the Garden of Gethsemane, he he sent his petition to God, Not I, take this cup from me, O God. But then also he responded, went through that journey of complaint and petition and then remembrance and trust in the Garden. Take this cup away from me, but not my will, but your will be done. And so we see that lament is a gospel movement in the Christian life. We understand God's goodness on the cross through this journey of suffering. As we we cry out to God in our complaints, we are crying out to a crucified God who died for the sins of the world. A God who is drawn to us in compassion and love. As we petition and say, God, act according to your character, we see God's character as Jesus Christ. And so we have a, a sure foundation Uh, as the writer of Hebrews says, the throne of of grace and mercy that we can come to boldly. Because of God and Jesus Christ, we know who God is. We know his character, so we can petition him. And then again, we're drawn to his love and to trust him again. So I encourage you, uh, whatever laments you're carrying right now, whatever, you know, those questions I asked earlier, those, where's the sorrow in your heart? Where's the longing that's not been fulfilled? Where is, where is, uh, do we feel that God has hidden himself from you? I encourage you to, to give those to God in prayer. 
to go through that journey of, of uh, complaint and then petition and then remembrance and trust. And I also encourage you to do that for the world around us. This is a time of lament for the world in many ways. We can lament over our city, our city of Seattle that we have so many complaints about, but we see that God loves so much. We can lament over the city. We can, we can give our complaint to God. We can give our petitions to God. We can remember that God is the Lord of the city still. And we can do that for our world, our city, for ourselves and each other as well in this, in this church. We know that there's so much suffering and pain right now that many people are experiencing. Things that we don't share with each other. We don't share our laments with each other that much. It's a very vulnerable thing to do, to share your lament. Especially in a climate in the church sometimes where laments are not welcome. So you share a lament and someone will go, oh no, but the Lord's with you. The Lord's working. He's doing good. You don't need that in the midst of lament. You need to listen to my complaint. You need to, you need to complain with me. You need to petition with me. And then we will trust God together. So today as we kind of uh, close, we're going to practice this because me preaching about it is just one thing. But really lament is meant to be practiced. So in our time of prayer, we're going to come to a time of lament. And I, I will lead us through this in prayer. We're going to go through these four movements of, of prayer. So I encourage you to, uh, we're not going to speak them out at this time, but I encourage you just to be honest with God about your lament, to give them to God and go through this journey of uh, crying out and petitioning and trusting and remembering. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, we thank you that you are such a good God, that you allow us to lament. What a God that you allow us even to complain about you, <laughs> to you, to your face. You allow us to accuse you and to give our unedited uh, prayers to you, our unfiltered pain to you. When we don't see you working according to your character, even though, as with Job, you told Job, do you know what I'm doing? Do you see what I'm doing? You don't know a bit of what I'm doing. Even though we see that in Job, we also see that invitation throughout the Psalms. And even Job had the invitation. He boldly said what he said to you, God. He was not worried about your answer because he trusted you. Help us, Lord, have that kind of faithfulness that we're not worried about how you're going to respond because we trust you. We trust your character. We trust your goodness. You may rebuke us. You may remind us that we don't know what's going on, that we know not even a little bit of what you're doing. But know, we know that we can come in boldness because you're a good God who loves us. You are Jesus Christ. And so we trust you and your character. So, Lord God, we lift up our, our, our complaints now. The ways we feel you're silent, the ways we feel you're not working according to your character, Lord, we lift them up to you in the silence of this place, Lord. Hear our prayer as we give you our honest complaints. And we also, God, as we have asked why and how long, Lord, we turn to petitions asking you, please help. Please work according to your character. We lift up um, Afghanistan and Haiti, and we lift up other places in the world where there is great suffering to you right now and ask, please come. Act according to your character in those places. Hear our prayer.
Lord, and as we cry out and as we petition you, Lord, we know that those two acts don't lead us to be less compassionate to other people, but to be more. Lord, we know that as we lament for others, we, we are drawn to their story, we're drawn to their needs, and we're drawn to, to act in the ways that you act, to act uh, in love as you love. And so now, Lord, we remember you. As we petitioned you, we remember how you've worked in our lives, Lord. We're drawn to mind just a few ways that you've been working in this past week or two or in the last month or year. And as that cycle goes on, Lord, we, we, we express our trust to you. And we express, Lord, how we seek to trust you in the midst of all of the prayers that we prayed so far. Lord, that we seek to, to follow you even though sometimes we can't see what you're doing. We seek to trust you that your, your character is, is mercy and that you are a humble king. And you are a victorious king. So Lord, we give our trust to you that we follow you even though sometimes we can't understand. We can't see you. Here are declarations of trust. And we pray the prayer that you taught us, which leads us to trust you and to, and to call out to you. We pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory 